Değerli meslektaşlarım, hepinize iyi akşamlar. Geç başladık çünkü Lola Renzi'nin saat farkı nedeniyle orada saat 8, bizde 9. Önümüzdeki perşembe günü yoğun bir kongre bizi bekliyor. Kongre öncesi son webinarımızı özellikle embriyolojide çalışan arkadaşlarımız için dünyanın bu konudaki en iyilerinden birisi olan Bayan Laura Renzi, Renzi bugün oocyte freezing ve embryo freezing hakkında bize bilgi verecek. Yani, e, i̇nşallah çok faydalı olacak. E, Mrs. Renzi, I am very happy to introduce to Turkish embryology group. So we will be listening with pleasure. Thank you. Yes, Sinan. Uh, okay. Um, Laura, thank you very much for being with us tonight. Um, so um, I'm going to give a brief uh, introduction of you to our listeners. So as you know, um, Laura Rienzi is uh, uh, one of the uh, most distinguished scientists in the reproductive field. Dr. Rienzi is a senior embryologist and lab director at the Genera Centers for Reproductive Medicine in Italy. She has been a member and has been in the scientific committee of many uh, international and national societies in our field and also has held editorial positions in uh, major scientific journals as well. Uh, she has uh, authored more than 150 articles with a brilliant age index of 44. So it's our pleasure to, uh, to be able to listen to you, uh, Laura, about oocyte and embryo freezing. Then we can discuss uh, together with the questions uh, from the audience. Yeah, the screen is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure for me to be in Turkey virtually. And I like very much Turkey. I have a pleasure to come a lot of times and I hope to be able to come back soon. So embryology in Turkey is very, is very good. So I know that the audience will be very participating and I'm very pleased to talk about my preferred topic, which is vitrification of all sites and blastocysts and how much this has completely changed the figure of IVF. So this is my declaration of conflict of interest, nothing specifically related to this presentation. So vitrification, we have to be as embryologists really proud about what we have done in the last years. Because by introducing such an efficient way to cryopreserve all site and embryo, we have in turn give a lot of new opportunities to our patients. So it's not only a lab procedure, this lab procedure has changed the figure. For instance, we have, of course, enhancing the cumulative live birth rate per cycle, because by, of course, when we think about the chance of success of our couples, we have to think not per transfer, but per cumulative transfer, adding fresh and frozen embryos. We know how much they are powerful, the frozen embryos, the vitrified embryos. So the denominator uh, is uh, per cycle, and we should not talk anymore about pregnancy per fresh cycle, but including fresh and cryopreserved embryo. And this is much more hope to the patient, and we know how much is the contribution today of cryopreserved embryo. But cryopreservation has also allowed to increase the safety of our, uh, of our program. It's incredible how a technology in the lab has improved the safety of IVF. Because if the gynecologist is confident with the cryopreservation program, in turn, we are going to transfer less embryo at the time. Because if before we had two embryos and we knew that by transferring one and cryopreserving the second one, we had like 50% chance to lose it. It's clear that we were transferring two together. But now that we know that the rescue of embryo is very, very high, and we are going to see how much high, now we can easily postpone the transfer of a second, the third, or the fourth embryo by doing single, repeated single embryo transfer. So single embryo transfer means safety, means less multiple pregnancy and more safe procedure. But 
Talking about safety, we can also choose today to cryopreserve all the embryo and skip the fresh transfer in case, for instance, of hyperstimulation, of risk of hyperstimulation. So it's so powerful that now the gynecologist can make the best choice for his or her patient by doing single embryo transfer, freeze all, and of course, repeated transfer to enhance the commutative live birth rate. So really powerful. I'm so proud about what we did in the lab. But it's also an opportunity for ourselves because by cryopreserving embryo, we can extend the time needed to assess the quality of the embryo by introducing new biomarkers, genetics today, but tomorrow many others, because we have time. We can collect media, we can collect cells, and we can send to the genetic lab or to other kind of labs. And we are, we are in this way learning more about the embryo and predicting better, which is the embryo with the highest chance of implantation. But vitrification, especially of eggs, has also opened the door to a new population of patients. Uh, fertility preservation, we have now new patients, the one that before we could not treat, but now we can cryopreserve the eggs before a treatment, which is a gonadotoxic treatment that will uh, affect the, quality, the future quality of the eggs in case of, uh, for instance, cancer treatments. So we can preserve the egg and tomorrow we can offer IVF more successful to these, couple, to these women. So it's incredible. Not only uh, we have enhanced the quality of our treatment, but we have we have also we can also include today a new population of patients. Fertility preservation for medical or non-medical reason, and we know that today uh, we call it non-medical reason, but uh, it's, there is a social problem with the postponing of uh, of maternity all around the world, and this of course increases infertility uh, to to patients that are. Uh, thinking to having baby after 35 or 40 years old, now we can preserve the eggs and give a better chance to pregnancy with their own eggs later on in life. And then it's also allowed to make all-site banks. All-site banking is really very important to optimize uh, all-site donation, but it also offers a possibility to import eggs. Imagine that in my country, in Italy, egg donation was forbidden for many, many years when it was readmitted by the Supreme Court as a right of uh, infertile patient, we had no donors. It was forbidden. Of course, we never had donors in our country. So how can we offer this treatment if we don't have donor? We were, meant, we were able to offer this treatment at home in Italy by importing vitrified eggs. So it's so powerful. And we have to be so proud because it's not only a lab procedure, but it's a lab procedure that translates in so many opportunities for gynecologists, for clinicians, and patients. So we call it a game changer. And it is really a game changer in the lab and in the clinics. So um, we have, uh, together with a group of experts in, uh, in 2016, we have published with the systematic review and meta-analysis of how much vitrification is powerful compared to slow freezing. And this is especially regarding survival rate. Survival rate has significantly improved and in turn clinical outcomes has improved. So it's not that slow frozen embryos were uh, not good as vitrified, but they were surviving less and they were losing cells and this impact was impacting their potential. So let's see how powerful is this technology. So this is uh, uh, different studies comparing slow freezing and vitrification. And as you can see, it's very rare in a meta-analysis. All the studies are on the right side of the one means they are all in favor of vitrification. There is not a single study that did not find an advantage of vitrification as compared to slow freezing. And this is super rare. And moreover, it is related to any kind of embryo at any stage of development. And if you see the survival rate is something really impressive. The mean survival rate, so it's, rep it's reproducible because the mean survival rate was 95.8 ranging from 90 to 100%. You cannot find in IVF such a powerful technology and so consistent across the lab. Maybe it's, maybe it's, it's similar. 
So 95.8%, trust me, I am an old embryologist. And if uh, 20 years ago when I started, I mean 30 years old, let's say, 20 years ago when I started IBF, somebody would have told me that we would have been able to cryopreserve embryo with 95.8% survival rate, I would not have been it. So it's really incredible. This is for embryos, but my presentation will not focus only on embryos, but also on all sites. And it's clear that all sites, it's a much more difficult story, much more sensitive. And this is not due to the size. Many people say, ah, because it's big. No, because the 2PN stage embryo has the same size and survives very well. It's due to the intrinsic nature of this cell is due to the fact that when we prior preserve this cell, there are some important biological changes in the zona pellucida, but uh, in the aging, in the meiotic spindle configuration, in the cytoplasmic uh, cytoskeletal uh, structure. And moreover, the membrane has a very low permeability, different from the 2PN stage. And so it's much more difficult to preserve all this structure during cryopreservation. So this is why it has been so difficult to implement fertility preservation and egg donation bank before the advent of vitrification, because only vitrification by its nature, we are going to see later on how it works, is able to preserve well all these different aspects of the cell. So if you, if you see here, there are very few studies comparing slow freezing and vitrification. Actually, there is only one randomized controlled trial, and then there are studies on sibling oocyte. And why we have so few studies? Because it's so powerful, it's self-evident. People are not making randomized controlled trials when they see immediately the difference between vitrification. So we should not complain that there is not enough randomized controlled trial. When a technology is so powerful, the penetration is very fast. So the evidence that we have comparing slow freezing and vitrification is only one randomized control trial when we look to uh, the, the real uh, outcome measure, which is pregnancy rate or live birth rate. But we have different study on sibling oocyte comparing slow freezing and vitrification. And again, all the oocyte that were split to the vitrification procedure instead of slow freezing were surviving better. So again, all the study on the right side of the one, very impressive. So the, the, uh, you can find this publication on your reproduction update 2017. Now, as a biologist, I know that the old sites, okay, survive or doesn't survive, but I understand because of the membrane permeability, but it's based something that I cannot see by just assessing the survival rate, which is the, configura the configuration of the meiotic spindle. So a very specific aspect of the embryo is, of the oocyte, sorry, is that the chromosomes are aligned in the metaphase plane of the meiotic spindle. And if vitrification or slow freezing would compromise the meiotic spindle, then the migration of the chromosome could be affected. And in turn, in the embryo, we would have more aneuploidies. There is only one study that has assessed the difference between fresh and uh, vitrified oocytes that were splitted from, donor, for donors, from donors. And they, they, this uh, very nice group from um, uh, US, uh, Richard Scott group, has assessed the aneuploidy rate of embryo that were deriving from fresh oocyte or vitrified oocyte. And what is very nice is that they have assessed the aneuploidy rate in arrested embryo, in usable blastocysts, and overall. And as you can see, the blue bar and the yellow bar are exactly the same. So we can conclude that vitrification is not increasing the risk of aneuploidy, is not increasing the risk of arresting embryo due to aneuploidy or uh, to increase the aneuploidy rate in usable blastocysts. This is a very important study. After, there is also a lot of studies on obstetric and neonatal outcome. And of course, it, it takes time to make this kind of study, but now we have enough evidence to say that luckily enough, uh, the babies that are born from vitrified oocyte has not an increased risk of malformation. So this was very important. 
And it was so important that uh, the two major uh, international society and then all the others after has removed the label of experimental procedure after this study were published. So after the study of 2008 and 2010 of Anna Corbo on all side donors, and after two Italian studies, one was mine on infertile population, showing the results, the SRM and ASCO say, okay, all side vitrification is a standard procedure in IVF. And what was even more important is that the ASCO, the American Society for Oncology, has stated that it's mandatory to offer to a young woman under, undergoing a gonadotoxic treatment to offer the possibility to cryopreserve all sites. So it's not only that now we are looking to the infertile population, but also to the oncological population. And this is really very, very important. So we have a great experience on all sites, uh, fertility preservation for medical and non-medical uh, indication. This has been published on Jobby this, uh, this year. And uh, we found uh, no differences. The, major, the main population of patients that uh, cryopreserve all sites in our setting are non-medical reason or for IVF treatments. Very few oncological patients are referred to our lab, so we have to work on this according to what we see in Italy. Uh, but we offer a real and concrete chance of pregnancy for this patient. And I think that this study is very nice from Anacobo, but has even a greater experience than us, showing uh, how many all sites are needed to obtain a live birth when you use all the embryos. So it's a cumulative live birth rate, including all the embryos produced by the court of frozen oocyte. And in fact, it's very similar as we see with, uh, with fresh oocyte, with donor oocyte. More oocyte you have, higher will be the chance to obtain a cumulative live birth rate. Uh, so in uh, if a blue bar is young patient population and the green line is advanced maternal age population. And it's very clear that young patients have better chance as compared to older patients. But if we think about fertility preservation done uh, with a female age under 35, so we are preserving fertility, as you can see with 10 oocyte, about 42% live birth rate, cumulative live birth rate can be expected with 15 oocyte, 69. So I think it's a very acceptable. It's not 100%, it's not, a, a sec, it's not sure that a baby will be, derived from uh, the, the fertility preservation program, but the probability are very high. With advanced maternal age, of course, the situation is completely different and it is the same, but we consult, what we say when we do consultation to patient for IVF. So of course, the chance are much high, lower if a patient has an advanced maternal age. And as you can see, this is true for fertility preservation and for, uh, for, for non-medical reason and for medical reason. For medical reasons, when you have 12 oocytes, you expect in young patient population to have about 61 live birth rate. Why we have less oocytes here as compared to here, but because the time that we have to make fertility preservation in medical situation is much shorter. So normally we cannot do two cycles, but only one. So this is why we normally accumulate less oocytes when we have a medical indication as compared to a non-medical indication. Now, what about all site banking? I like very much the story, uh, the Italian story, that we were able to offer all site donation in Italy because of importing uh, um, vitrified all site. But of course, when we started, we were looking to different registry and we were saying, okay, is it working to use vitrified all site instead of fresh all site in all site donation? If you look to the SAR data, which is the American data, you see that fresh oocyte seems to behave better than prior preserved oocyte. So this was a little bit scary. However, these data were based only on one cycle and not uh, on cumulative cycle. So they were not considering the embryo deriving from vitrified oocytes. And this study was not a randomized control trial, but it was a study looking to the general uh, labs, any indication, no, com no control comparison. 
So when we want to assess the difference between fresh and prior preserved double side, we have to look to randomized controlled trial if available. And it is available in the literature. We have this very nice study from Anna Kobo again that has randomized 600 recipients, half to uh, fresh all side banks and the other one to vitrified banks. And uh, I'm making a long story short, same ongoing pregnancy rate per intention to treat, same ongoing pregnancy rate for per cycle, same ongoing pregnancy rate per, uh, per uh, transfer. So very, very powerful data showing that in good hands, vitrified all side behave as well as fresh all sites. Now, there's a lot of different studies showing the same, a lot of literature showing that egg banking is really efficient and is really feasible in different settings for site donation project. Now, uh, what was what our strategy when we, ha we had to face uh, this difficult new technology? Uh, in Italy, it was forbidden, we had to face. We, we went step by step, and I want to tell you the story because I think it's, it's interesting. So first of all, what we wanted to do is to keep a patient in Italy. So what we decided is to import the oocyte and have a complete control of the cycle inside our lab. So to perform ICSI at home, to, to, to personalize the treatment, decide how many oocyte to allocate to the patient, decided at what stage of development make the transfer. When we take care about our patient, we want to have a control inside our lab. So this is why we really wanted to have the old site in our lab instead of asking us um, to produce the embryo in, in a different country and then import only the embryos. So at the beginning, we were importing six, seven old site uh, and we were doing day free transfer. When we decided to import eight, nine old site to be able to go to blastocyst transfer. And why this? Because uh, we really needed to improve efficacy and safety. So when you deal with vitrified oocyte, you have to expect about 85%, in our case, 86% plus, min plus minus 16. So it means between 17 and 100% survival rate. So that's why if we think that five, six all site is the ideal number, you have to import one or two more to be sure to have a, not the right number of uh, all sites survive for insemination. Then you can transfer on day three on, on, or on blastocyst. We did both at the beginning. I'm going to show you here is easier. So what we did, it was cleavet stage transfer, but unfortunately at that time we decided to make only 17% of single embryo transfer at the cleavet stage and 83% of double embryo transfer. And what we obtained is it's 28% twins. So this was unacceptable. This is why we moved to blastocysts where we were much com more comfortable to transfer only a single blastocyst and in that case, we did 96% single embryo transfer, only 4% double embryo transfer, and we had exactly zero multiple pregnancy. So step one, we solved the problem. Blastocyst, single embryo transfer. Then we, have, we were looking to the cumulative live birth rate when we were importing six all sites, seven all sites, eight all sites, or nine all sites. Cumulative live birth rate, among completed cycle means that the patient has finished all the available embryo. And as you can see, with six all sites, the ongoing the cumulative live birth rate was 35%. These are live birth, huh? including the baby born. 44, 69, and 59, but this is not significantly different. So this is why we moved from 6, 7 to 8, 9, because we thought that over 50% was the ideal expectation we should have for an egg donation cycle. When we look to survive at all site, of course, you see better the impact of the number of all sites on the results. So we had a big fight in Italy because many centers were saying, no, 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 why should you import all sites? Let's just send the sperm in a different country and, and get back the embryo. So this is the published paper that has been produced by Lamarca and, and, and his group on URI production. So big fight in Italian meetings, all site embryos, all site embryos. At the end of the story, 
we had exactly similar data. When we look to live birth rate per site utilized, multiple pregnancy, depending on the philosophy of the transfer and number of site required to have a delivery. So very interesting. Both technology can be used. It's up to you and your setting and your collaboration to decide what to be used. So embryos and all site vitrified works equally than fresh and can be used also for import and export in this uh, very demanding uh, procedure where donors are often missing. So now let's look to a second a very difficult aspect. So uh, the two very, very uh, sensitive moment where to cryopreserve preserve is all site, as I said, but it's also biopsy embryos. After the biopsy, slow freezing was really not working. So this is why vitrification has been a game changer also in TGT cycles. The problem is but when you, you make a biopsy and the hole in the zona pellucida, it's changed completely the survival rate when slow freezing was applied. But what happened with vitrification? Miracle. Again, vitrification was so powerful that we had a very high survival rate, even in biopsy embryos. And these are the published study, but we, it's a multi-center that we have performed with different centers showing that you can have a very high survival rate, even with the six, the seven blastocysts with good and poor morphology. Of course, better is the blastocysts, better will be the quality and the survival rate. Now we had discovered during this study, but not only biopsy blastocysts, but also the blastocysts that were collapsed before vitrification were surviving better than the full blastocysts. So we learned during this multi-center study that blastocysts survive better if they collapse. Either collapse due to the biopsy, either collapse due to the laser shooting, as is seen on the right side of the slide. So as you can see, science is not only for publish, it's not only for showing the results, but it's also to learn. And multi-center studies are really very interesting. In our setting, we were not doing uh, 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 embryo collapsing before vitrification, and now we move to embryo collapsing uh, before vitrification. So to say how powerful is this technology, Basically, for the first time in IVF, we can personalize, we can decide according to the patient and the clinician will when to vitrify. Basically, we can vitrify any stage of, the be of development. They are all very efficient. It's clear that more the embryo is uh, advanced in the development stage, less absolute number we will have. So let's make just a, 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 an exercise. When you have 10 all signs, you have seven fertilized, you have five embryos, three blastocysts as a mean. So you see, one blastocyst is basically counting for three X, three or four X. So when people say, yes, but all sites survive 85%, why blastocysts 95, 100? Yes, but when you lose one blastocyst, it's like if you lose one, uh, three or four all signs. So as you can see at the end of the story, if you correct the survival rate per absolute number, it gives you the perception that you can use whatever is necessary. They will be efficient the same. So when you deal with fertility preservation, never do embryos because the patient may have no partner and you have to use donor sperm. And I really don't like this because you are limiting the, the future possibility of that woman. And if she has a partner, maybe she can change partner in the future, of course, depending on how much if they are married, not married, in which country we are. But still, we are linking the fertility of that woman to the, the partner. When we do fertility preservation, for me, we should separate egg and sperm. But when you do IVF, probably it's better to go to the, to the best embryo you can have in the lab, which is the blastocyst. Better survival, more selected embryos, more uh, prediction on implantation. But very interesting that we have all the possibilities. Now, what is vitrification? You all know, it's the conversion of material in glass. And this is depending on three factors, which is cooling and warming rate, viscosity, and volume of the sample. Everybody knows this. But is everybody knowing exactly which is the combination of cryoprotectant that 
has been used to produce all that evidence that I show you. Sometimes we forget biology. So people are telling me, uh, I use that company or the other company. I don't care which company producing the media. What I care is that you know that the combination uh, is ethylene glycol, DMSO, and sucrose. This is the combination that has generated more evidence and the one that has been more validated. So if you use a different combination, there are people that are using only ethylene glycol, only DMSO, or different combination of cryoprotectin like pop and diol, it's different, you have to validate it. I'm not saying that it's not working, it was not working in my hand, this is the best combination, but it's clear that this is the one that is validated. So it's very important to know what we are using. When it comes to the volume, it doesn't matter which is the carrier that you are using, the important is the volume that you reach. So uh, there, is no ex there is no the optimal carrier, what there is is the optimal volume around the outside or the end. So again, this is going to maximize the cooling and the warming rate. Now, another hot topic is, should we use open or closed system? Look, uh, open system are more efficient because there is no doubt that uh, the, 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 the warming and the, the, the freezing and the warming rate will be fast. Now we have a, prob a potential uh, problem of contamination here. I have to make a disclosure that I, I am in the scientific book of N-sterilizer, but I can tell you that there is not only N-sterilizer, there is different way to sterilize nitrogen. So if you are scared about this, you can sterilize nitrogen and keep the best technology, which, which is uh, faster uh, uh, cooling and warming rate by uh, using open systems. So in our setting, we have validated a protocol with uh, open system protocol with sterile nitrogen, which has been, of course, certified also by our inspectors. So now the point is, are we all good the same? It's to return to Sorry. their initials. This is a paper that has been uh, a recently paper uh, published on jo Joby 2021, and it's a hands-on paper. You can see the video, you can see all the tips and tricks. Uh, but it's clear that I want to show you a piece of this video because you have, you have to be, um, um, we have to know that this is a manual procedure and being a manual procedure, it makes a lot of difference who is doing what, and of also, is it the first vitrification of the day or if it's the last vitrification of the day? We are human and we can be tired, more distracted. So manual procedure can be super, can be really optimized, but still it's depending on the operator. So because we keep, we love, we love KPIs in our lab, we are keeping really all the, the key performance indicator in our, in our laboratory, we have tested how much operators and kits are affecting our vitrification program. It's such a key procedure, we have to keep it under control. So as you can see, after the training, the 11 operators that we were checking had exactly the same performance when we're looking to prior, uh, to prior survival. We looked to the operator that was performing vitrification, and then we looked to the operator that was performing the work and there was no significant difference. So we validated our training protocol. Then we look also to the different, uh, of course, the same two different uh, uh, companies producing two different kits, but with the same mixture of cryoprotected. Uh, so because we, 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 we didn't know if we could mix uh, two different uh, kits uh, for vitrification, sometimes you may for, for for distribution problem or for price problem, you have to change the kit in the lab. So what we have demonstrated here is that you can freeze with one kit and warm with the same one and have 99% survival when we can use one kit and warm with the second one, or we can have another one. And apparently there is no difference between the different kit as long as the cryoprotectant mixture is the same. So this is also very reassuring. Another question that often comes up is um, what is the duration of cryopreservation? Okay, because some, uh, some paper, but not others, have claimed that longer is the cryopreservation in our tanks, worse is the live birth rate. There is a decrease in live birth rate according to the cryoduration. 
Okay, you have to know about one, two, three, four, five years when it's uh, talking about nitrogen, it's really zero. It's not, it's the same. So it was really biologically not logical that one, two years in nitrogen could affect live birth weight, except E, the cryo storage is not performed in a, in, well. So imagine that you have a lot of, uh, of uh, embryos frozen in your tanks and sometimes you take them up or you don't keep them uh, plunge in nitrogen or plunge in, uh, in vapor of, uh, um, of nitrogen guaranteeing the right temperature. So manipulation can affect, of course, especially with very slow, very small volume of vitrification. But if a vitrification is, uh, the cryo storage is well performed, it's unbelievable one, two or three years could affect biologically the cells. So we did our own study that was presented in Ashra and is now published on uh, RBM online. And in fact, we were seeing, oh my God, but strange enough, when we were looking to 60 days, six, uh, a month, sorry, 90 months, 180 months, we had a decrease in life birth rate. But then when we're looking to more time, no difference. So let's think how to make the interpretation of this data. These are second babies. This is our second choice embryos. So what I mean is that when you transfer, you transfer the best embryo first, and then you keep the worst embryos. If a patient is not pregnant, not pregnant, not pregnant, you are going to warm the worst embryo that is in your tank. This is logical. So when we make the correction of the cryo duration to the quality of the blastocysts, the difference disappears. And why here you come up to have a very good light birth rate because here there are second baby, not second choice embryos. These are a population of patients that probably had a baby on the first cycle, come back more time later, and they are the best prognosis patient. So this is a lesson. We have to make a very strong interpretation of the data before claiming something. And also we have to have a, always a biological uh, rational uh, when we make the interpretation of the data. So again, we need a statistician and when the statistician made the correction, uh, 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 as I said, when as a confounder quality of a blastocyst was, um, was analyzed, uh, as I said, no difference were present. Prior duration is not affecting, affecting the survival rate and the live birth rate, uh, if of course the cryo storage is well performed. Now KPIs. KPIs are really very interesting. It's difficult, it's very difficult to have right KPIs. It's difficult to choose the KPIs and it's difficult to follow up the KPIs, but this is an effort what we need to do. Because uh, when every month you collect the data, we are a big network now with 25 clinics and I'm responsible, I'm scientific director of this uh, crazy number of clinics. So I need to control that the quality is preserved because this is what we offer to the patients. So what I use is the control chart It's also published on fertility and sterility. So every month we put the survivor rate, if, uh, if the KPI is survivor rate, we have calculated which is our mean survival rate. We have calculated we have, which are the warming, uh, warning limits, which is two interval uh, standard deviation. And then we have also set the control limits, which is three standard deviation. So what happens when we have a problem? We can see the problem before it becomes a problem. And we can act before we have uh, really a lower survival rate. And what happens here? This is what is even more interesting. When we, you have an, a significant increase in your KPI, you can redefine the protocol, export it to the other clinics, and in turn make uh, improvement in quality of your treatment. So just to make you an example, we, we have a central ba bank. So the same old sites are distributed to different clinics in Italy. And we control the survival rate of the donor eggs. We have set the two interval uh, uh, at 85% up to 90%, 97%. As you can see, all the clinics were in between the interval, but there was one clinic that was significantly higher. We have revisited this protocol of a green clinic and we have exported to the other clinic and we are seeing an improvement in the results. So KPIs are not only here 
to 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 see problems but also to make to make uh, uh, improvements even more important now if you know me i don't know but i've made a lot of presentation about automation now we said okay we can train the, bio the embryologies they can be super good but still it's a manual procedure so it's subjected to potential differences according to the status of the embryologist, including myself, all the, my team. So I love the idea to have a machine that could standardize the procedure and can ensure to patient to have the same survival rate everywhere, example, in our network. So I was very positive with uh, this, uh, this evolution in the lab, but we have to be sure that the procedure is standardized the procedure has a lower duration and has a staff convenience. So it is difficult to introduce automation in IVF. Probably we are not yet there, but we should not be against it because as much we introduce technology in our lab, as much we are going to produce development to increase the quality of our treatment. And we should never be negative about changing and improvements. So I'm going to conclude saying that vitrification has been an incredible, incredible, powerful technology to improve survival rate, to improve timing and cryopreservation. We don't have, we have to wait the end of the day to put all the embryos in the machine, but we can be very flexible. And the flexibility of the lab means better relationship between lab and clinician. At the last moment in the afternoon, oh no, I don't want to make a fresh transfer. I'm scared that my patient is in hyperstimulation. The lab has to answer, no problem. We are going to vitrify it. We'll take 15 minutes and we are all happy to do it. So as I said, vitrification, it's incredibly powerful, especially uh, for embryos, increasing cumulative live birth rate, being able to introduce pre-implantation genetic testing. Uh, for for um, for blast assist, for uh, for all sides and the operator and the kids can be trained and can can offer really very very successful results. Although we should not be negative in thinking about something that could standardize, but what is more important is that we are we have to keep monitoring what we are doing, even if we are very confident with our technology, it's very easy to make mistake and repeat mistake and change the setting of your lab. So I would like to thank you for this invitation. I'm sorry I was very long, but still we have time for questions. And this is all the clinics of our network. I am very proud about this, this network that we are building all around Europe. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. This, is, was, this was a fantastic talk, a uh, very uh, comprehensive talk. Thank you very much for being with us. So uh, there will be questions, of course. Um, and actually, this is uh, a very uh, a very detailed one, actually, uh, but very essential one. So congratulations with your, uh, uh, with your uh, results also. So uh, I would like to ask a question, first of all. You talked about the personnel, the staff that go with the vitrification and the quality control is very important among your all clinics. So what do you think is um, for a trainee embryologist to go for the routine cycle uh, in, in, regarding vitrification? I mean, what is the learning curve uh, for you, the time period? Uh, because yeah. because we know we, we start with the vitrification uh, going from slow freezing to vitrification took a lot of time for many clinics so how about your new uh, trainee embryologists so it's clear that there is um, an intrinsic capacity of a person they are not all the same so it's not only the number of procedure but it's also the quality of a procedure so we start, the training starts with a GVO site or all site, spare all site. Okay, mm -hmm. so we make the training on this all site because it's very important to really practice and to practice uh, to use the spare all site is very useful. So we do at least 20 to 50 uh, vitrification with spare all site. 
We are not looking to the survival in that case. We are only looking about how the manipulation is performed. Yeah, the technique. Yeah. But when the technique is rich, it can be 20, it can be 50. We start with embryo or blastocysts, depending on the setting, or, or not normally we don't start with fresh oocyte, with real oocyte, but we start with embryos. And the tutor has to be there until, so always with the second person, until at least 50 embryo with more than the KPI in, inside the KPI um, are obtained. So it's, it's quite long. Huh? It can take one year because you don't have a warming immediately. I see. Yeah, one year is, I think, the optimal uh, period. But yeah, some uh, people can be more um, rapid. Uh, good, good at, yeah, rapid. Yeah. So a question from audience, is there any correlation or differences between OCIT yield per cycle and oocyte survival rate? I mean, the uh, women with more oocytes retrieved are better uh, for cryo survival. No, we, we, we have put this in, the, in the, our statistical analysis and the oocyte yield was not related to oocyte survival. And uh, of course, when you have two oocytes, when you have one oocyte, it's 100% or zero. But as a mean, we didn't find any correlation between the size of the court and the survival. However, when there is a lot of oocytes, the survival rate go, went down. Mm -hmm. And this is probably due to the, to the, bi to the embryologist. Because when you have to, to, to oh, yeah. preserve a lot of, lot of oocytes, your attention is a little bit lower. This is human. Huh? If, you have, if you have only two, you will be super precise. If you have 20, you will be less precise. So this is why I'm saying that automation can really help. Especially and yeah, that. yeah, yeah, got it. So uh, how many embryos do you uh, vitrify at once in a one carrier? Uh, there's one. another question. One per carrier. Yes, because embryos, huh? because we have a mandatory. Oh, no, 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 I'm sorry, the oocytes. I'm sorry, yeah, oocytes. embryos because you are doing the uh, single transfer. Uh, that's why, yeah, okay. Yeah, but oocyte is up to three. At up to three. Yes, we were putting even four and five, but mm. in our statistics, it was reducing the survival rate. So now we put three oocytes as a maximum. Okay, another question is if we don't have possibility to sterilize the nitrogen, um, do you think it's okay using the closed um, systems? Um, what, what do you think when you compare? Do you have a comparison at least? So at the time, I was not able to sterilize nitrogen. What I did is a special de deal with a company that was producing nitrogen. So what I wanted okay. is nitrogen directly from production to my lab in my container. So no possibility to be infected by other cells or other I contaminants. I always use an uh, open system because I think that physically is better. So I'm not going to, for a technical issue, I'm not going to reduce my quality. So I don't have direct comparison. There is very few direct comparison. With blastocysts, I would say that is quite good, but more sensitive more sensitive, the cooling and the warming rate is lower, so more sensitive. But for embryos, I would say that there is quite a validation. For all sites, I'm very skeptical. Then you are storing them in a liquid phase, not vapor phase. Liquid phase. Okay, good. All right, a very short question and short answer. Uh, you inseminate told all sites with uh, ICSI, right? No classical yeah. IVF, all right. Uh, Okay, the question is, uh, what is the timing for oocyte cryopreservation after retrieval? I mean, do you wait? Good uh, question. Yeah, and, uh, and the, the opposite, when you thaw, are you going to wait for uh, the, the, the insemination? Yeah, so normally we, uh, being the time zero, 36 hours post, ACG or post uh, um, trigger. Uh, so, because uh, I saw some centers that were doing the egg retrieval at 44 hours post triggering. So, in, in the lab, we have to remember that uh, hour zero is 36 hours from triggering. We vitrify at 38, between 37 and 38 hours. So, one or two hours in the lab, but not decumulated with the cumulus and corona cells. Then we denude the old slide yeah. and we vitrify. At warming, we wait at least one hour. And there is a paper of Giovanni Coticchio showing that there is a full re re 
repolymerization of a meiotic spindle after at least one hour, one hour and a half. This is why mm. we have this waiting time. Okay. What about the higher uh, rate of albumin in the uh, in the culture media after towing both embryos and oocytes, maybe? Yes. Because some some centers are using this. Yes, too, it's yeah? true. It is an old concept. Huh? It's a very. Yeah. I'm an old embryologist, so uh, yeah, me too. many many years ago, many many Not years, you, especially but... in US. But they're using for a transfer a very high concentration of albumin. But in reality, this was done because the viscosity of the media was increasing and it was easier to put the amber in the catheter and to inject it at the transfer. Mm -hmm. There is no rationale behind this. There is no really validation of this. We don't use higher albumin, but I cannot really answer because I don't have a study. I know what is the history of that, but I don't That's see rational. It. Yeah. I don't see rational. Okay. Another but question. Yeah. If somebody has a comparison, I'm I'm super happy to listen and uh, and and to, yeah. to try to see. That. Okay. Another question is um, the survival rate of oocytes over age 38 uh, in women. I, I will combine this question with uh, another question of mine. So for social freezing. Do you have an inclusion criteria for your centers? I mean, a woman comes in 44 years of age, non-married, so, and asks for oocyte cryopreservation, and you see one or two antral follicles, low AMH, of course. What are you saying to those patients? That's the most difficult question <laughs> possible. So let's say uh, I will start with the age. Yeah. So, when a patient which is younger than 26, 27 with a normal ovarian reserve, we are going to postpone. We're going to say to the patient, come back after 30. Why? Because- After, uh, after I'm sorry. 30 years old, 31, okay. 32. Before 35, but between 30 and 32. We okay. always say, this will be your gift at 30. Mm -hmm. If it is a normal responder, we have made the scan, we look the uh, antrophallico, everything is perfect. If a 22 years old woman come, we don't say do fertility preservation because she's so motivated at 22, but that she has a very high chance to conceive spontaneously before 30. If a woman is already thinking, I mean, this is the, uh, now, uh, maybe in the future it will be different, but today there is a study showing that 70% of these couple, these uh, women will conceive at before 30 alone. And we had a lot of letter of patient calling back say, thank you so much. You were so nice. I relaxed a lot. I made my baby. If you would have been, you didn't talk. And so the reputation yeah. is even better. So we wait 28, 30, according to the patient will, of course, but we don't promote too early. So this is for the young age. Then fertility preservation. Fertility preservation means that you are in the fertile range. So mm -hmm. we, we advise up to 35 37, according to the ovarian reserve. After 37, we start saying, look, we are not in the fertility range. So we are preserving infertility. But now let me tell you, ask you a question. If a, 30, a 42 years old woman with two antra follicles comes with her husband, are you going to make IVF? Uh, possibly. Possibly. Depends on the gynecologist. Okay, but for me, the philosophy is you should not discriminate a woman because she's single as compared to another woman because she has a husband. Yeah. So if in your center you accept or you may not accept to make a cycle in that condition, if a woman would be with a husband, I think it's not fair philosophically not to offer the same treatment to that woman because she is alone. And she was just to postpone the same treatment. Of course, yeah, you have to correct per survive, potential survival of it. Mm -hmm. So we don't promote at all IVF in the condition you were saying, zero. We have published a paper showing 45 years old, zero live birth rate, zero live birth rate to, to show to our patient that we don't yeah. want to treat. But I think about discrimination of women, and I don't think it's fair to apply yeah. two different philosophy if it is a single or it is a married or a, a, a woman with it. It's mm -hmm. difficult, right? It's a very difficult Yeah, question. yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah, you're very right. Yeah, uh, good point. This is, this is what we should do. Then 
uh, the other point is the survival rate. Believe it or not, the quality of the oocyte is, of course, strictly related to female age, but from a chromosomal point of view, not from a uh, mm. membrane. Survival of from, from survival, yeah. And even blastocyst formation is very similar as mm -hmm. a percentage, not as an absolute number, because you start from less oocyte. So uh, pay attention, but female age is related not to the morphology, not to the survival, not to the blastocyst formation, only to chromosomes. Okay, anoploidy. All right, thank you very much. Well, another question, maybe last, I don't know, regarding the KPIs. What parameters you evaluate for blastocysts together with survival rates? Re-expansion, or what are yes. you looking for? Yes, so, so in our lab, absolute, in absolute, for threshold side and for vitrified side, of course, if it's vitrified with survival rate, blastocyst formation, timing, day five, day six, day seven, and morphology, trophectoid and morphology, uh, inner cell mass, and degree of expansion. So all these KPI are under control, and we look if how many blastocysts expanded with normal uh, inner cell mass and trophectoid we have on day five, and all the categories. So it's like nine categories of blastocysts that we plot mm -hmm. to be sure that maybe uh, there is a shift in, uh, in blastocyst morphology because something is changing in the lab. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, these are the questions, actually, no more questions. Uh, so for blastocyst vitrification, you um, just take out the blastosol. As I understood, uh, With, yeah, just laser shooting. Huh? Laser shooting, okay. okay. And after thawing, uh, how long do you wait for a re-expansion or expect? Based uh, the paper from Brussels showing, but if after I don't remember one or two hours, but I think it's two hours. There is no re-expansion. There is zero percent implantation potential. Okay. Do you wait for that time or? We wait for re-expansion. Yeah, before so before transfer. We All don't right. transfer if it's not re-expanded because really, really it's very low survival rate. So we take the chance to move on another one in that case. Okay. One, two questions more. Uh, one is what are the precautions to be taken to protect from COVID-19 um, in the laboratory for vitrification for these things? Do we need to have an extra uh, precaution? No. Um, in the I, I, I really don't, don't think so. I think we have to protect ourselves and ourselves, by protecting yeah. ourselves uh, with masks, for instance, because the only risk is to talk in, in front of nitrogen and that we are no saliva in the nitrogen. So mm -hmm. I think that with the protection that we are using, we have to be very, very confident, but it's not the cells that are at risk with COVID, but it's ourselves. So we have to really to keep protection. The lab is, is very, it's very safe because of a changing of the air. Normally we have very high changes, but we are very near to each other. We are very yeah. friends. We are, so it's, it's a risky area. So yeah. please protect yourself and think about this. As far as I know, there is no study about COVID-19 or uh, the virus in the liquid nitrogen, no? It was not yet found. We have yeah. some studies showing, uh, but uh, there is some uh, warning about nitrogen mm -hmm. and COVID-19, but there is no, it, it never, I don't think that it has been found. Okay. Or should uh, not the, be yet. All right. The last question is, um, do you use Polescope, uh, the polarizing microscopy to visualize the spindle? Between 1999 and 2002, I was using a lot of uh, spindle view. Okay, did, did, you, did you have a chance to, to combine it with vitrification cycles of all sites, maybe? Yes, we published a lot of pictures of mm -hmm. the behavior of a meiotic spindle during uh, warming. Uh, but this was for study. Eh? This was really when we did the implementation of vitrification. Luckily, we saw that all the magnetic spindle was really uh, repolymerizing in a very nice way after one hour after warming. So this is why I'm saying we, we need to keep, wait one hour. But okay. it's not for, for, for clinical use. It was all really right. to study. Okay. Well, I think the um, questions are like that. Laura, thank you very much. This, this was a perfect uh, speak and uh, very good to chat to you. Uh, yeah, it was my pleasure also. I hope you're I, not, you are I, not I, missing Marcos too much. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we, we will catch him someday. Yeah, all right. He cannot, uh, he cannot. Uh, He's get my away. friend. All right, okay.
So thank you very much. Hope My to see pleasure. you again. And hope to see you all soon. Hopefully in Turkey. Uh, me too. Also I also, Turkey. yeah, I miss Turkey too. So <laughs> yeah, so we go. Yeah, see you soon. See you soon. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Bye bye, everybody. Okay, bye bye.